galactic flows and dwarfs. We're starting five minutes late because I lost track of time. Sorry, but uh, that'll be fine. And uh, I had an announcement. If you brought food in, which you shouldn't have, take it out when you're done. Don't leave it behind. And our first presenter is Nir Mendelker. Close enough. <laughs> um, from Jerusalem, who will be uh, describing cold streams in galactic halos. Hi. Pleasure to be back here in Santa Cruz. It's also a pleasure for the first time in six years to not be discussing giant clumps in this conference. Um, <laughs> so I hope you all, um, you all enjoy it. I'm going to be discussing... Um, so I put in the title the number one, and I, the, I put the number one here as, as, as we'll uh, go along in the talk. The point I'm trying to make is that this is the first step in a much larger long-term um, pr um, project that we're um, um, uh, undertaking in order to systematically um, understand how these, um, 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 how these um, cold streams at high redshift are able to feed the massive star-forming uh, galaxies that we, uh, that we observe and how they are susceptible to various types of um, um, in, uh, instabilities uh, along the way. So I'm going to start by kind of giving a brief um, cosmological um, um, context to the problem, and the first thing that we all have to bear in mind is that galaxies form in the cosmic web. This is a map of the dark matter distribution from uh, the um, Millennium Cosmological Simulation, and there are essentially two main types of galaxies that you can see here. You have your typical halos, which are of the order of the Preschechter mass, which form within fairly thick filaments, and therefore they are fed their gas and their dark matter uh, in a in a roughly spherical way. Now, this is quite uh, typical of star-forming galaxies at, at, at the present day, which have, uh, wh wh which have the virial masses of about um, 10 to the 12 solar masses, which is about the um, uh, Preschechter mass at redshift zero, and we observe that their star formation rates are of the order of five solar masses per year. On the other hand, the very massive halos, the high sigma peaks, reside at the nodes of a few very thin filaments and are fed in a very different way. Now, this is very typical of star-forming galaxies at redshift 2, because, again, their um, typical halo masses are 10 to the 12 solar masses. This is much, much larger than the Preschechter mass at that time. So these are really high sigma peaks, and we observe that their star formation rates can be as high as 100 solar masses per year, or even higher than that. Now, that was dark matter. This is gas. This is uh, what you're seeing here is a movie of the gas density from a simulation done with Ramses. And you can see, this is going to loop around so you can see it again. At the center, you have a disk um, 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 galaxy that forms at the nodes, at the um, um, intersection of a few filaments. And these filaments supply the gas directly to the galaxy. Uh, both, you have both a, a, a smooth component of gas as well as mergers. Everything flows along these filaments. Now, that's the first kind of context that we want to keep in mind. The second context is the concept of um, virial shock heating. It was shown a few years ago that there's a critical halo mass, which is the same, about um, 10 and 12 solar masses. And in galaxies that are more massive than that, the cooling time becomes much uh, longer than the compression time, which results in the formation of a stable hot shock at the virial radius. Um, of course, at high redshift, as we've said, that these galaxies of 10 and 12 solar masses are fed with these very thin filaments. And since these um, um, uh, thin filaments are so much denser in the surrounding halo because they're much, uh, they're much thinner, the cooling time within the filaments is expected to be a lot shorter. And that allows the filaments to cool extremely rapidly. They do not form a stable shock. And they are expected to be able to go all the way through the hot halo and reach the central disk uh, galaxy. But the question is, do they really penetrate the entire way? This is another simulation, this time run with the art code. What you're seeing here is the gas density, and you can see here the virial radius and the disk at the center here. And you can see that at about 0.3 times the virial radius is what we call the messy region, or an um, interaction region, where streams, they can collide, they fragment, they clump, they break up, and there's a whole big mess. And it's not entirely clear how exactly this happens and what this means for how the gas will reach eventually the central disk. It's also worth um, pointing out that the, uh, those 
uh, who work on the um, um, illustrious simulation don't really disagree with this picture. They just claim that instead of 0.3 RVR, this um, interaction region can be 0.5, maybe even 0.7 times RVR, but qualitatively it's the same thing. So this is really what we want to um, be able to um, uh, what, we, what we want to be able to study. But using cosmological simulations is not really the tool to do this because in most cosmological simulations you don't resolve the streams by more than a few tens of cells at best. And that's not enough to really resolve the detailed physics and the instabilities that occur within these uh, uh, streams. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. So the main questions that we want to address, do the streams break up before they reach the central galaxy? We want to address the clumping of streams and what effect that might have. What kind of um, energy dissipation the streams are going to have as they make their way towards the central halo. And what would that mean for the observable radiation signature? What would that mean for the um, accretion rate and the thermodynamic state of the gas uh, uh, by the time it gets to the disk? And how will that eventually affect the star formation uh, rate? In order to do this, we want to study, from a fundamental physics point of view, the growth of various types of instabilities. You can study hydrodynamical instabilities, which is the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability of a dense supersonic jet in a hot dilute medium. You can study thermal instabilities, which could perhaps be seeded by the Kelvin-Helmholtz, um, in, 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 by the uh, in, uh, initial um, Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities. You can talk about external gravitational instabilities, the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. You can talk about self-gravitational instabilities, for example, local um, um, genes collapse. And what we want to do is a bottom-up approach to study these things using simple analytic toy models, one by one, and in parallel using simulations. And you're going to hear on Friday uh, a, a talk uh, showing the first steps of, of, of that. And what I'm going to discuss today is the hydrodynamic instability, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, which while being the simplest, is much more complicated than you might have thought. So the toy model picture that we have in mind, we have a cold stream, a hot halo, and a galactic disk. Uh, the cold stream is about um, 10 to the 4 Kelvin. The temperature is just set by the cooling curve because it cools very, um, uh, it cools very efficiently. The halo, which is shock heated to the virial temperature, has a temperature of about um, 10 to the 6 K. And if you assume that the halo and the stream are in pressure um, equilibrium, that gives you a density contrast between the stream and the halo that can range between 10 to 100. In addition, the stream is uh, going to be flowing in at approximately the virial velocity, while the sound speed in the halo is also approximately the virial velocity. And if I define the Mach number of the flow as the velocity of the stream with respect to the sound speed in the halo, you get a Mach number that can be on the order of 1 to 2. Now you should bear in mind that the Mach number of the stream with respect to its own sound speed can be well above 10. This is very supersonic flows. Let's talk about the relevant um, t t t t time scales for the problem. The first uh, time scale is, of course, the virial time, the time it takes the flow to reach from the virial radius down toward the center. The second important time scale is the Kelvin-Helmholtz time, or the time it's going to take instabilities to grow. Now, clearly, the greater the ratio of TVR to TKH, the more severe the instability will be by the time the stream uh, gets to the center. Another very important time scale is the sound crossing time within the stream it itself. And the reason for this is that if the sound crossing time is longer than the Kelvin-Helmholtz time, the two sides of the stream are not going to be in causal contact. And what you really have to cons consider is just a one boundary instability. If the sound crossing time is short, you have to consider a two boundary instability. And as I'll show you, that makes a very important um, difference. So let's just talk about the one boundary instability. You have, uh, you have them um, two fluids that are separated by a barrier with, uh, that have a density contrast um, delta and a Mach number uh, m. Without going through the math, you can work out the growth rate of, uh, in the linear uh, regime as a function of the density contrast and the Mach number. And that's what you can see here where I've normalized the growth rate to give you the ratio of the virial time to the Kelvin-Helmholtz time. Now this region here where the Mach number is goes to zero, this is just the incompressible limit. This is the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability we all studied in our undergraduate degrees and we all know and love. Okay, but this is only this region here. Now as you can see by looking at the numbers here, in the incompressible uh, limit, the stream is clearly unstable with many, many, many Kelvin-Helmholtz times in a virial time. <laughs> but you'll notice that this big white region here is a region where instabilities simply do not grow. The, the, the configuration is entirely stable. 
All right, and, then, and that creates a very interesting thing because if I look at a density contrast of uh, delta is, is equal to 80 and Mach equals to uh, 1, you get the stream is unstable, but if all you do is take m from 1 to 1.5, suddenly the stream becomes uh, completely stable. So that's already somewhat strange. Now what happens if I account for the, for the geometry, for the confinement of the stream? You can do this either for a slab or for a cylinder. Uh, what I'm showing you here are the growth rate as a function of the wave number for one case where the sheet is still unstable and another case where the sheet is already stable. The plots are a little complicated. Let's go through them one by one. This green line is the same in both plots. It's the incompressible solution just for the reference. The black line represents the same mode of um, um, instability called the fundamental mode. When the sheet is still unstable, you'll notice that the mode uh, goes up with the growth rate being proportional to uh, the wave number, just as in the kelvin helmholtz instability that we all know and love. But in the, where the sheet is stable, the growth rate turns around and goes to zero because the sheet in this case is stable. So as you go to very short wavelengths, this configuration should also be, uh, uh, should also be stable. All these other lines are, are uh, ad um, ad additional modes called body modes that only appear in very supersonic flows where the velocity divided by the sum of the two sound speeds is larger than unity. Now each individual mode, the growth rate goes to zero as the wavelength goes to zero, again because the sheet is stable, but you could go along this ridge line formed by the peaks of all these different modes, and you can get an effective growth rate for the stream, which does diverge logarithmically with the wave number. Now I'm coming to the end here, uh, just to get a sense of what the difference is in these modes, how does the instability look like, this is the case where the sheet is still, um, uh, is still um, 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 uh, unstable. What you see here is the perturbation and the pressure, and it just looks like two one-boundary solutions, where they de the uh, perturbation decays extremely fast away from the boundary. However, if we're in the regime where the sheet is still stable, and we're uh, only focusing on the body modes, this is um, a a n equals 0, n equals 2, n equals 5, and what you have are various standing wave um, patterns within the slab. How does that come about? So this is, this is uh, now a, a movie from uh, a simulation. And what you're going to see here is that the way these um, instabilities form, the way these um, body modes form, is not directly from the surface, but only due to waves that were propagating and being reflected and transmitted uh, from the, the boundaries of the slab. So it's very, very different than just the one boundary instability, and you need this, uh, the slab or cylindrical geometry to show it. And this is comparing the results from a simulation after a sound crossing time to the analytic calculation of what you expect the instability to look like. And the results, in my opinion, are really quite remarkable uh, how, how well they fit. Just the final uh, note comparison to uh, simulations, what, uh, in terms of the growth rate, so the dashed line is the um, predicted growth rate, the solid lines are the result from two different simulations. This is the movie we saw where the um, initial conditions were just localized on the boundary of the stream. And this is the sound crossing time of the stream. At shorter times, the um, perturbation does not grow because the, sheet has n the, the slab is not, yet, um, um, uh, is not yet coherent. The two sides are not yet in causal contact and the sheet is actually stable. Only once the two parts of the slab become coherent do the, um, does the perturbation begin to grow according to the proper growth rate? This is if I put as my initial condition the correct eigenmode solution for the, um, for the perturbation, and then you grow according to the growth rate from the beginning. So the final conclusion, the money plot, the takeaway point, what are the conclusions for cold streams? So I'm showing you here the number of e-folding times we expect the perturbation to have before it hits the disk as a function of the um, the density contrast and uh, the Mach number for a thick stream where the width of the stream is going to be equal to 10% of the virial radius and again 10% of the virial radius versus just 1% of the virial radius and for a long wavelength which is equivalent to the stream width equivalent to the stream width but only 10% of the stream width and the dashed line is the expected region of a parameter space for cold flows in galaxies at high redshift and it's right at the phase transition between the very fast growth of instability when you're dominated by surface modes or the very slower growth of instability where you're dominated by the body modes. But you can, in principle, uh, be very affected by Kelvin Helmholtz uh, in, uh, instability as you go away. And I'll end with this movie, which is just showing what happens to the nonlinear um, e evolution of body modes 
through shocks within the stream, which eventually cause the stream to disrupt from the inside out. It basically causes the stream to explode from the inside as you build up the pressure in the stream due to these shocks that keep on growing. And I've, I'm already gone a bit over time, I apologize, but just my summary. This is the first step in a systematic study of instabilities in cold supersonic streams as they penetrate the hot halo. The conclusions from this work are that, first of all, Kelvin Helmholtz instability is a lot more complicated than we thought. The body modes are going to be the dominant mode of instability for supersonic jets. And in terms of cold flows in virial halos, parameters are right at the boundary between two phases of instability, a fast mode and a slow mode, but KHI may be important for the evolution of cold streams. In a paper that is currently in preparation and will hopefully be done soon, we're going to present a quantitative analysis of the nonlinear um, evolution, which I showed you one movie here just a moment ago, and the medium to long term, as I mentioned, we will one by one add additional physical um, processes in order to gain a full understanding of the problem and address the problem from the bottom up. So thank you. For a question, Andrew. Very interesting. If you, if you set it up so that the boundary layer has a sort of finite width, yeah. do you have a sense of whether any of these results change qualitatively? Yeah, so in fact, the simulations that I set up, they did have a finite width to the boundary. Uh, in terms of the growth of surface modes, that's going, so in, the, in, the, in kind of the fast regime of instability, that will cause short wavelength perturbations to just not grow at all. But in terms of the body modes, it really doesn't make much of a difference because they're dominated by, you know, the body and not just the surface. Uh, let's thank Nir again.